Um, Maury is a technical account manager for Acquia, uh, based in the UK. Uh, he is also a coordinator, co coordinator of the Drupal security team, or a coordinator. There's a few, aren't there? Yep. Um, he's uh, the admin, or one of the admins of the uh, Japan group on Drupal, uh, Drupal groups on GDO. Uh, he's a module contributor and core translator. Um, so he translates core strings into Japanese, if not other languages as well, maybe? Yeah, shut that. Yeah, God, please. Um, and he uh, works with customers uh, who operate internationally with over 20 offices around the world. So uh, as you can see, he'll have the ex sort of experience that um, he needs to be able to talk about this topic. Um, while the talk is, while Maury is, um, I'd say, a techo, really, fundamentally, or historically you have been, uh, today's talk is not going to be overly technical. Uh, it's classed as an intermediate level. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to, you to welcome, please, Maury Sujimoto. And we'll just swap over microphones here, so talk amongst yourself for 10 seconds. Uh-oh, you hold that. Hello? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Okay. So, sorry for the delay. Uh, my laptop isn't uh, working very well with the projector. So, um, okay. So, let me start. Um, so, just to uh, give you a quick introduction about myself. Uh, well, you already know my name. <laughs> my name is Mori Sigmoto. Uh, my screen name is Doc Mori. I've been using Drupal for the last six years. And uh, I'm based in the UK, although I'm originally from Japan, and uh, I work for Acquia. And very quickly about Acquia, um, so we provide um, expert 24/7 Drupal support. Uh, we op we provide um, optimized Drupal hosting, so it's a um, um, plat platform as a service. So you basically bring in your code, and we look after the rest. Uh, and we also through uh, like trainings and professional services, uh, we foster Drupal adoption. Um, and also we are hiring, so, um, and we are especially interested in um, hiring um, tech, um, client advisors. If you're interested, um, please let me know. We have uh, many other posts available as well. Okay, so um, can I quickly ask about yourself? So. Um, uh, are any of you developers or okay, developers, uh, project managers, okay, and like business businesses interested in using Drupal or have been using Drupal already? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, okay, well, if you're developers, you're probably pretty experienced with Drupal, but. Um, so um, people who own business, what's your um, experience with Drupal? It's like, have you, have you been using Drupal? Yeah, okay, cool. So good, um, good to know. Um, yeah, so since there are some developers, I might, uh, I would be adding some technical details to the talk. But um, just so you know, just to make it very clear, it's about multi uh, Drupal adoption for multinational organizations. And it's not about multilingual Drupal. Uh, some people thought my talk is about multilingual, but it's not. So if you are not, uh, if, if, you, if you're here to, uh, to uh, learn about multilingual Drupal, unfortunately, you're not going to learn much about it. <laughs> Sorry. OK, so um, I'll be quickly going over. Um, about the benefits of adopting Drupal, and uh, also um, in in multinational, in in the context of uh, multinational organization, um, it makes it quite more um, a lot more complex. So there would be peculiar challenges related to um, this kind of uh, use case. So I'd be discussing about uh, these challenges as well as solutions to that. So, um, so first of all, um, benefits of using or adapting Drupal or 
um, disadvantages of not adapting Drupal. So um, a typical scenario for multinational organizations is that they have um, many country, uh, they have businesses around the world and each, each country office has their own website, which, you know, which is fine. But um, if they have these websites uh, on different CMSs and different frameworks, then it becomes a problem because um, the, the way things are built um, is quite different. And also, each site needs to be built from scratch. So you need to, if, if you've been involved in a uh, web, you know, web development project, you know how, um, how much effort it requires. And if you need to do this for you know, 20 or 30 country sites, then it's, it's a lot of work and, and money as well. So, and Drupal can really simplify this. And oh yeah, and on top of, on top of that, if you are uh, using proprietary CMSs, then you'd have to pay uh, pay for the license, so it uh, adds you know further cost. So building each site um, from scratch on multiple CMSs is quite inefficient. And um, I, I'd like to dig down a bit deeper on this. So problem of of having multiple CMSs is that um, the, the reusability is quite poor. So for example, if you want one feature on all the sites, you need to build that feature in different, for, for different CMSs. So for example, um, in, in the uh, EU, there is now a law that if, you, if, you, if your site uses a uh, cookie, you have to notify the visitors that uh, your site uses cookie. And um, it, if, if you have five websites in the uh, EU, and if they're all on a different platform, then you need to develop that simple feature for five of those different um, CMSs. So it's quite, um, the, the reusability would be quite poor in that kind of scenario. And also, uh, if you want to have uh, the same, same look and feel for all those sites, all, all the sites you have, you need to build uh, a theme or a template for, for each of those uh, CMSs. So um, poor reusability means uh, more development work and more maintenance. And also, um, if, you are, if you've um, been involved in Drupal development, you'd probably know this, but uh, there are a set of um, best practices and standards that you want to follow. And if you have, let's say, 10 different CMSs, it's, it's quite difficult for your developers to adhere to best practices of those, uh, all those 10 different CMSs. So that can lead to um, substandard quality and low maintainability. And also, um, Applying uh, bug fixes and security updates for all those CMSs would be quite cumbersome as well. And if um, a group of editors are in charge of updating um, those different sites, um, you'd need to train, train them for different CMSs as well. So that's uh, another inefficiency. So um, the the solution to this is to build a Drupal-based platform and then build those um, country sites on top of that. And Drupal can, the, the, the reason why Drupal is so good for this kind of use case is that Drupal allows you to um, run multi multiple sites on a single code base. So even if you have, um, 30, 40 sites, you only, need to, you only need to update the code in one place. So for example, you have the, the core and common features and themes in, in one place. So if, if, you, if you ever need to apply updates, you only apply that to that one place and then it gets applied across all the sites. So that makes the maintenance very simple. And 
um, benefits of having such a Drupal-based platform, it's basically a reverse of what I've just talked about. So high reusability, if you need a certain feature, you, you basically build that feature once, and then it, it works on all the sites. And also, uh, it, the same thing applies for the theme. So if, you, if, you, if all of your, let's say you have 20 sites, and it, if all of the 20 sites need to have the same look and feel, you basically build one theme, and you enable that on all the sites. And um, what, one of the customers I was uh, working with had a, had a real issue. So they, they had multiple websites. Um, for they, they, had e each, uh, they had a site for each um, country, country office. And if you, if you, if you um, look at them side by side, they have different sizes of logos. Uh, they use different color schemes, some of which were not uh, um, actually not allowed to be used, but um, they, they weren't following those um, uh, design guidelines and so on. So they, those sites looked almost like uh, they were for different, com uh, different companies. So you can, you can avoid that kind of problem quite easily by using this kind of platform. And also, um, rapid construction of new sites. This is a real strength of uh, this, this type of platform. So basically, um, what Drupal allows you to do is to, um, to build um, this thing called install profile. So if you, if you run that, you can spin up a site within, within a matter of seconds. So you, you have the platform and you have an install profile to spin up a site, then um, if once, once you build the platform, you can, you can create new sites very easily. You just basically run the script and then populate the content and do a quick UAT and you can launch the site. So it's, it's very efficient uh, compared to like what you saw you know, going through all the, the phase of the development. And like I mentioned, um, because you, you can update the, the, you can apply update in one place to, um, for all the sites, uh, the maintenance will be much easier. Well, there are some challenges which I will talk about later. And also, hosting requirements will be simple. Um, if, if you have multiple CMSs that runs on different uh, technology, for example, you know, you might need to have uh, Ruby or Java, and then um, or requirements for servers would be completely different. However, if you have this, this type of platform, then all you need to have is a stack that can run PHP and MySQL, basically. So it can really simplify hosting requirements. So this, this is also another um, um, thing that reduces uh, the maintenance overhead. So um, in terms of cost efficiency, so th this is, uh, I can't tell you how much it would actually cost to build a platform because it entirely, it, it entirely depends on how complex your solution is. But uh, just to give you an idea, The initial development would involve uh, development of the platform and uh, common theme and features. And you also need to document um, how things work and you provide trainings. So um, let's say you have 20 sites and you, you, you spend, um, for, for first four sites, it will be uh, initial development and transitional phase. So you'd be working on a number of common features. But once you have the platform in place, the rest of the 16 sites can be spun up very quickly, like I mentioned. So it really cuts down on the, on the development cost. So it, it really improves the efficiency of not only the development, but also uh, maintenance. And it provides you with a uh, better return on investment as well. So uh, it looks all you know nice and easy, but um, 
is it really straightforward? Um, I would say yes for, um, for kind of common websites. So if you're talking about common corporate sites, so you, you, have, uh, you have information about your company, about your products and services and articles and quarterly reports and so on, then having, have building those sites on this kind of platform would be technologically quite straightforward. However, because, because of the, the complexity, it um, comes with a number of challenges that, that are quite peculiar. So I'd like to cover those. So challenges, um, there are challenges in different phases. So uh, the first one is in, uh, during the pre preparation phase. And the second, was, the second one is in the development phase. And the third one is in operation and maintenance. So during uh, preparation phase, um, Consensus within the company is very, very important because um, if um, the, the, at least the companies and the organizations that I've worked with, uh, if, they are, if they are operating globally, they have quite complex uh, organizational structure. And also, each country office is uh, quite autonomous. So they have their own budget for w web development. They can do whatever they want, basically. Well, th um, there are budget restraints, but um, they, they don't have to. Um, they, they, can, they can make on, own decisions on, on their web projects. So it makes it a little bit difficult for, to, to get a consensus on all the, site, all, all the offices. So. Um, when I, when I worked with them, I had to help them um, share the Im image of success among those, um, those country offices. And also, um, there would be restrictions because the platform is shared. You can't do everything that you want to do. There, there are some things you, you can't do or you have to collaborate with other offices. So it's... Um, it can't be it can't be done as quickly as they wish, so there would be some restrictions. So they they need to understand that, and but there 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 are benefits that um, are definitely worth uh, the trouble. So they need to they need to understand this uh, before this project can um, in, in order for this project to succeed because you don't want them to drop off. Um, uh, in the middle of the project, and you you really need their support and understanding to um, lead the project to success. And also, um, this is this is kind of kind of a common issue uh, for for any project. But uh, selecting the right vendors is uh, is a big challenge because because you have uh, multiple offices, you'd be hiring. Uh, multiple vendors, so that makes it slightly more challenging than just selecting one right vendor. And then the the vendors must must be highly competent. There's no question about that. They they must know well about Drupal, um, and they they need to be able to adhere to best practices, and they they need to know what they're doing basically. But um, for main so you have two, in this kind of project, you'd, you would have two types of vendors. One is the main vendor who would be building and maintaining the platform. So they, they, have, a, they have a great responsibility in, in this kind of project. And they, they need to be not only um, competent, but they need to have adequate resources because the project can be quite big and time. Uh, effort, um, I'm just saying, um, intensive. So they, they need to have um, adequate resource to be able to run this kind of project. And they need to be highly capable in managing projects because this, w with this kind of project, you'd have, um, 
you'd be working with an organization which has a quite complex organizational structure as well as you'd be working with local uh, companies and vendors as well. So they need to be able to m manage that well. And as, as part of that, they need to be able to um, communicate well and they need to be able to manage customers' expectations uh, well. So um, local, local vendors, they would be, it, it depends, uh, they, they need to be good developers, uh, good, good Drupal shops, but it what they need to do really depends on what the country sites need and how, um, how complete the, the platform is. If the platform can provide all the s solutions that country sites need, uh, they'd be doing some minor modifications. So it, as, as long as they are experienced with Drupal and uh, they, they understand Drupal stand, uh, best practices and standards, it might be sufficient. They may not be doing any custom development. But um, they need to be, because the chances are they would be, their mother tongue would be not the um, common language of the company. Uh, they, they need to be able to speak the, the com company's common language um, fluently. So if it's Spanish or English, they should be able to communicate well in those languages. So in order to ensure that the vendors um, are ca capable, um, before, before signing a contract with them, uh, you'd want to explicitly um, define set of uh, acceptance criteria and they they must be able to understand that and execute that so if they they need to be able to uh, they need they need to know what Drupal best practices are in terms of um, development and um, like security performance and so on and they, they need to be able to of course deliver deliver that and if it really helps to clearly define this and uh, b before before they uh, they sign the contract and also um, in terms of project management it's more difficult to assess um, their capability so you can ask for references and ask for customers who um, who who are happy with the way they manage their project and you can ask them and get get uh, first-hand um, opinions and um, information about th those vendors. So, um, so the second challenge is are um, during uh, development phase. So, uh, project management is uh, well again it's a it's a common thing, but because of the complexity, it, uh, it makes it quite challenging. Um, I myself uh, have come across a project that. Um, didn't go very well because of um, because of the the complexity uh, of the of the organization organizational structure and the communication and also uh, maintaining quality since you would have multiple vendors working on the same code um, you really need to think about maintainability so um, I'll go over these um, one by one. So, um, because the company is um, the company that um, operates internationally would tend to to have quite a complex organizational structure. Um, communication would be very complex, and you would have multiple stakeholders involved in uh, uh, from multiple departments involved in the project. So as a result, uh, there would be conflicting interests and requirements. And uh, the, <coughs> the problem um, I've, I've faced was that within the company, there were two IT departments who were in charge of different parts of the, the platform. So they, they had a uh, budget for certain parts of the, the platform and the other, um, the other 
um, department had a budget for some of the, the country websites and so on. And because they were not communi communicating um, with each other, the developer, um, the development shop had a real hard time capturing the requirements and building the, the right solution for them. So um, managing communication is, is really a key. And in, in order to resolve that, um, so you should simplify communication. You know, they, um, the, the organization really need to come up with a way to um, communicate their requirements to the development shop in a, in a unified way. And also, um, to do that, you need to clarify responsibilities. And also, um, it, it happens quite often in uh, traditional development um, methodologies, such as waterfall, which is um, not, I, I don't know how common it is now, but uh, I, I see that, um, I see still being used. but. Um, if you if you stick to uh, traditional development uh, methodologies, you don't review often enough. So you get a, a big documentation on requirements, uh, and you go off and spend three three to six months building the the solution. And finally, when you have the customer review it, they they tell you that um, it wasn't what they wanted. So. Um, so reviewing frequently is very important. And through, through better communication and frequent review, um, providing better transparency can be possible. And also, um, a customer can't expect developers to understand what they want. They need to collaborate. And they, they need to really um, be involved in the, in, be committed to the project for, um, for them to um, have developers build the, the right solution for them. So um, in one word, basically, um, this is pretty much possible by um, doing Agile. So how many of you uh, use or are aware of uh, Agile project management methodology? Okay, great. And do you, do you use it in your projects? Yeah, yeah, great. Good to hear that. Okay, yeah. And also, you know, Agile. Sorry? So I, I can't hear you. <laughs> well, it depends. I mean, I think, I think it depends on, I mean, personally, I've, I've really, yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they, it's, uh, <laughs> It's a um, different mindset, really. And uh, also, you know, the, the way uh, budgeting, is, uh, budget, budgeting works, you know, can be slightly different. So um, doing it properly uh, can be quite difficult. But you want to do it properly. And um, I, I've seen many projects um, that, you know, they say, uh, you know, doing agile you know, didn't go very well because they weren't uh, applying the methodology properly. Uh, it, it is challenging, but it comes with all the benefits that I just talked about. So um, yeah, for, especially for this kind of complex projects, um, you, you, want to, you want to have a good communication going, and you, you want to make sure that you work, you know, customers, the customer and developers uh, work together to build the solution that they need. So um, I, I think Agile is, is, um, is a great solution for that. So um, as for maintaining quality, uh, it come, I can't see the notes. So I'll find out what I, I've written about. <laughs> but um, so the, uh, the quality consists of uh, different elements. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through those. Um, so I'll try to remember <laughs> what I've written. So OK, so ensuring scalability. This is slightly um, technical. But basically, when you build features for um, the platform, it should be as reusable as possible. So if you build features that are too, um, 
you know, it, that are too specific for certain sites, then you'd need to build, and, and if another site needs a feature that is almost identical but slightly different, you'll need to build uh, another set of features that works for that site. And then you will end up with five, ten different features that are um, essentially the same but a little bit different. Then m that, makes, um, main that makes it really difficult to maintain. And it also doesn't really scale. So um, there is a great uh, presentation about this by um, Jeff Beeman, he's, uh, he's also an Aquian, he's a senior technical consultant, and he did a presentation on this at uh, SoundCamp. So if you're interested, you can uh, see his presentation. There's a URL to that. Okay, um, and ensuring high maintainability. So um, because it's not just the main vendor that would be working on the code, but you would have multiple vendors working on multiple sites, but they would all go into the same uh, same repository. Um, they they all need to adhere to Drupal best practices, make sure they're doing the same thing in the same way, and also, uh, it, you know, five, uh, six to twelve months down the line, if you need to make changes. Um, you need to know, you need to be able to know, you know, what code is doing what. So it needs to be well documented. So uh, another thing, uh, up until Drupal 7, some configurations are in the database. So it needs to be, in, in, everything needs to be uh, in the repository. Um, there's, um, there's a module called Features that allows you to do it. And um, there are Drupal API that, also allows you to do this. So with, with a combination of these two, uh, you can really um, move everything, all the configuration to the code. And there's a great um, presentation on this um, because I can't see the note. I can't uh, remember the name of the company, but it's a Belgium slash Italy based company who did the presentation on this. So if you're interested, there's a URL at the bottom. And also, because you have multiple vendors working on the, the same chunk of code, um, you want to somehow restrict their access to the re repository. Uh, popular way to do it, uh, we, we also use this um, at Acquia for some of the customers, is to use GitHub uh, and pull request. Basically, um, reviewers can um, um, accept or reject the, the request to merge the changes that uh, vendors made. Um, we, we have, uh, I, I'm working with a customer who is slightly, um, who, who doesn't have uh, very much budget and um, reviewing um, every single commit is, um, is too time consuming and costly. So what we have decided to do was to uh, simplify that process a little bit by um, restrict, restricting access to directories so if if one vendor is working on the on a on a site for New Zealand office they'd only have access to the New Zealand uh, to the directory that contains the code for the New Zealand office and git by default doesn't give give you that kind of uh, granular access control but gitolite allows you to do that so that makes it um, <coughs> A little bit um, more sim simpler to um, manage uh, vendors' access to the repo, and there's this service called GitLab, which is um, based on Git Gitolite, and it allows you. It gives you um, same same. Um, how do I say? Um, it it's quite similar to GitHub, so it, they have this thing called merge request is, which is essentially pull requests and you can you can manage users and teams in the same way but uh, it's more powerful so uh, for this customer we use this as well and um, like I mentioned um, it's it's quite important that you make um, the components as reusable as possible 
and avoid uh, unnecessary dependencies. So you can you can only you would only have one version. If you if you end up with multiple versions of site because of some dependencies with modules, then you'd end up in maintaining multiple versions of the site or multiple versions of the platform. So it's it really degrades the meaning of having a platform. So you'd want to uh, stick to um, a single single version of the platform. And having automated tests, continuous integration, which is also very important because uh, it, you, you make one change to the platform and that gets applied across all the 20, 30 sites. So you want to make sure that those changes that, uh, that are to uh, common features don't break um, any sites. And also, if you're building a platform that um, which you know 20, 30 sites is going to be uh, based on, you want to you want to have the platform um, built as as nicely as possible. So um, before letting uh, multiple country sites migrate to the platform, you'd want to do a site audit to make sure that the platform is built in a, in a sound uh, and, um, and maintainable fashion. And also documentation, it's quite important. Well, it's, you know, it's important for any, <laughs> any sites really, but um, especially because it's shared among um, D different um, different country offices having having a documentation which all the the local vendors can refer to is quite important. So it's not only about documenting your code, but um, documenting how features are built, how they should um, interact with, uh, or how they should be put together, and so on. Um, that's quite important. Um, Security is uh, another challenge. So making sure, um, you know, uh, th there are, you know, common and easy uh, mistakes that you can make to, to make your sites vulnerable. For example, uh, enabling PHP filter or um, things like that. And this kind of check can be done um, by you know scripts, it, it can it can be automated, so you you should ha you should have that kind of um, automated uh, checks for this kind of um, this kind of issue, and also um, like l like site audit, ha doing a security audit for the platform uh, would be quite important as well. And in terms of the uh, performance, so it's it's more or less. Um, more or less uh, common sense stuff. So, you know, you want to ena enable internal, external caching, and this this is something that um, if um, if you're hosting your site on um, Acquia Cloud, we we do this proactively. So, if uh, if a customer turns off their um, external caching by mistake, we'd um, we'd get notified immediately because the site is in risk. So um, yeah, this kind of uh, check can be also done manually, and also because well, I if you if you decide to have all those uh, country sites on the same stack, you'd want to perform a load test on all the sites on the on the stack because ha doing doing a load test on a single site wouldn't really make sense because um, the the load that the stack would be experiencing is the sum of uh, the load of all the sites. So you'd want to perform a load test on the entire platform as a new site launches. So um, as I mentioned, there are many, many um, things that need to be checked, but that can be done um, automatically. So we built it. Um, if you if you have your sites on Acquia Network, you can run this um, uh, thing called Insight, which basically tells you the the health of of your um, your, your site, uh, how well it how well it adheres to the best practices, um, how well it 
it's set up in terms of SEO, um, how well it's set up in terms of performance. But you can also do this thing called instant insight. So if, even if you're not an, an Acquia customer, you can go to um, this URL, uh, so insight.acquia.com slash instant insight, and you enter a URL of your Drupal site, and we do a scan and tell you how, how well your site is built, basically. It's, um, it's quite interesting. Um, and I, I don't know if it's still running, but there's, there's a campaign that if you get A, uh, the grade A for all the, all the criteria, uh, we'll send you a t-shirt. <laughs> so um, yeah, you can, you can try that out and see how uh, your site is, would be rated. OK, so finally, the challenges um, during the operation and maintenance phase. So uh, change, release, and deploy management is, um, can be quite complex because of the number of the sites you have as well as the number of vendors that are um, involved in the project. And also um, because you, you would have different um, vendors and um, you know, if, you, if you're outsourcing um, hosting, support can be a little bit complex. So I. I'll go through that one by one. So governance, so change management. Um, because multiple sites share the same code base, you, you'd really want to be careful about making changes. So you, you need to, uh, as, as you make or as you plan uh, for, for changes, you'd need to assess and make sure that um, it wouldn't negatively affect some of the sites that you have. And y y you want to have, um, preferably, you want to have a formal process. Like you, you'd want to have a change control board. And you, know, you, you apply for the change, and you, uh, you assess the change and approve, and things like that. Uh, and also release management. When you make changes to common features, it would affect all the sites. So you, you would want to do a regression test. I, if the changes are significant, you'd want to do a regression test for all the sites. But um, in, order for, um, in, in order to make sure that all the sites are functioning as, uh, as they should, it can only be done really by uh, the, the webmasters of the country sites because um, no one would know all, how all those 20 sites uh, should be behave, behaving. Some, some sites may have some um, custom features, and uh, the people, in, people uh, in the central office may not be aware of um, how, how, it, how it works exactly. So by schedule, scheduling releases, you'd be able to allocate, you know, uh, provide um, uh, send, send out notices and give them enough time to uh, allocate resource for the regression tests. And also, because you have multiple vendors involved in the, in the development, um, you, you don't want all of them to be able to push code to production as, uh, when they want. So you'd need to have um, in quite strict uh, access control and deployment management as well. And for, for governance, using uh, RACI, so RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed. Um, ha having this kind of chart is really useful because um, you wouldn't be saying, OK, uh, this vendor is responsible for doing this. But you can, you can really. Uh, describe um, more, more precisely uh, which, party is, um, which party is responsible for what action. And also, even within the company, like I mentioned, um, companies would have a uh, complex organizational structure. So you'd want to have which department is in, uh, in charge of what action. And RACI really um, helps you to, to clarify 
So the challenge with support is that there would be multiple levels of support. Editors would be asking you know, how to insert videos to an article, for example. And they, they may also find some pages that aren't functioning as they should. And there may be some issues with uh, hosting. So if an editor has a problem, they can, you know, uh, ed ed some editorial issues, maybe they can resolve that internally. But some, some technical issues, for example, um, you know, some, some blocks are not displaying. Or if, you know, if they get a white screen of death, who, who should they contact? They, this, you know, editors shouldn't have to, uh, editors, you know, that, editors don't have to know different you know, vendors and you know, they, they don't have to make decisions on whom to contact. So one way to resolve that is to, um, for example, build a web form with a decision, decision tree uh, in, the, in the back end. So by selecting a few options, so is this, um, you, use, um, you, know, you, you, you answer a few questions like whether it's a uh, um, problem with the website or um, some questions regarding um, content creation. And then the web form would send support tickets to res respective parties. So it would simplify the communication. And also, if multiple parties are providing support, you, you want to make sure that it's comprehensive. And each vendor covers, uh, you know, you, you should make sure each vendor covers what others are not covering. So it, um, you can, uh, the, the support um, contract would cover all the foreseeable problems. And finally, um, there are there are legal requirements in different countries. For example, in the uh, EU, you need to store all the uh, personal information within the EU. So although, for example, Acquia has, um, Acquia uses some of the data centers in, in the States, we can't off offer those to our European customers. They need to, they need to use our, um, the, the Amazon's data center in, in Ireland. And also, in Germany, there's a law that all the personal information uh, needs to be stored within Germ Germany. So they can't even use this um, data center in Ireland. So what we did was um, that the site is hosted um, in, in the, uh, on the Ireland uh, data center. But when you pull the, the customer information, that comes from uh, some, some server that's hosted within Germany and that's uh, displayed within an iframe. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty, you know, it's a bit silly, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a law and you have to adhere to that. And you, you want to make sure that you, you build the right solution that, you know, that um, ad adheres to the law. And also, um, if, you are, if you have all the 20 sites um, in in one one region, for example, if you have all all those sites hosted on uh, in Ireland, but you know some of the <coughs> excuse me some of the the websites are for say like Hong Kong or Singapore, there would be latency issues. So one you know one obvious way to one of the obvious ways to resolve that is by um, using like CDN like Akamai example that you, you can also um, distribute hosting as well but um, you know, if, if latency becomes a big issue you want to certainly pay attention to that so I think that's all uh, thank you very much and uh, yeah if you have any questions I, ha I think we have five minutes How many sites is too much in one doc route? I, I think it's, it's a tricky one. 
uh, it kind of depends on what your you know what your stack is and also how your you know site site how complex your site is but um, at Acquia we have customers who have like 80 sites on a single dock route or 120 plus I think so sorry 160 um, well you know, talk talk to us <laughs> I think yeah I mean it, I guess it depends on what kind of site it is really but yeah from from what I've seen I'm pretty sure it's possible Right, so w what's the reason for for dividing the, the two? Right, um, yeah, well, it, I mean, you know, for, for like latency reasons, it, it you know, you, you might want to consider geologically, you know, placing one, uh, one, uh, set of sites in one one region and another set of sites in another regions but if, if you can combine the two and you know run it in one geographical location then yeah I, I personally don't see an issue in that yeah Right, okay. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so um, it's it's kind of a complex access control. Um, I've I've only I've only been dealt with uh, what I just talked about. So one is GitHub, a pull request, or um, Gitlite, or using you know uh, GitLab, which basically which is basically built on Gitlite. Um, so do, do you want them to be able to push it, push their change all the way across to the production? Or? Mm. Right. Right. Uh, for continuous integration, uh, okay. <laughs> shall shall we continue the the discussion after? Yeah, that's great. Okay. All right.
Listen, look, uh, thank you so much, Maury. Could uh, everyone please show their appreciation for Maury Sujimoto? <laughs> Um, just really quickly, uh, it's a coffee break now. Um, the slides, uh, Mori, um, we're okay to put them on the website, are we? So the slides will become available when all the slides for the, all the other sessions do. Every session is recorded, um, so we'll actually have a trans uh, not a transcript, a recording of the, um, uh, the audio plus the slides uh, on the website as well. Um, and remember to fill in your session evaluation as well. So there's a special link that's popped up on the on the program schedule uh, just recently that you that you can use to evaluate uh, sessions. And we really appreciate your feedback uh, with that. You can also put comments on the actual session page uh, as well, which um, Maury's you know done sessions before, and he'll he always takes feedback into consideration to improve his talk as well. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, next we have coffee, and we reconvene at quarter to four. Thank you very much.